Did that's a lovely to be here. Um, so we met at the Cambridge School of Art on the summer course, and um, I just fell in love with your work and your wonderful sketchbooks and picture books. And um, we got chatting because I was having a bit of a meltdown moment. <laughs> you were so sweet. I was like, I'm not finishing my picture book. <laughs> and you were just the sweetest, warmest tutor, really, just so amazing. And so you just stayed in my heart. And uh, and now you're coming to do a, a retreat at Inky Luck. So I'm so happy that we get to to work together again and do, yeah. do more picture book making. So you, um, fantastic illustrator writer of picture books who won prizes you teach at the wonderful cambridge uh, school of art ma is there anything you want to say before we move into questions and uh, no just hello to everyone um <laughs> lovely to be invited to the inky Lux retreat um and yeah just um i've been i've been working for about i think i graduated from the court because i did the ma myself there in cambridge i think i graduated in 2015 and i've been lucky enough to to be working in the world of picture books ever since and now i'm lucky enough to be teaching there as well uh so it's become come full circle really but yes yeah, so i just love everything picture books and children's and visual arts well how did you first get into picture books was it sort of a gradual thing or did you have that sort of aha moment that you know angels were singing and you know i don't know <laughs> how did it work out for you well, it's quite it was quite serendipitous really i when i left i did graphic design at university many years ago and i didn't enjoy it at all and vowed never to do graphic design ever again um it just wasn't for me um but i worked in print for many years in commercial print and uh got made redundant but all during that time my first job when i left university i actually worked for a children's book library um and so i had a massive collection of all the stuff they were getting rid of i had a massive collection of children's books so that's probably where my love of children's books started I didn't think about it as a career for, for years and years. I got made redundant from my print job um, and didn't know what to do. And I'd always sort of doodled and drawn. And I thought, oh, my wife, my wife's a teacher. And she said, oh, do an MA because it's, you know, it, it helps me with my career. So I just Googled local MAs and that was one of the ones that came up. And I went to the open day, um, absolutely loved the facilities there and loved the vibe there didn't really think of myself as wanting to become a children's book illustrator luckily got onto the course and changed my life really it just it's like oh yes this is what i want to do this is exactly what i want to do and i was lucky enough to have a couple of projects uh, published whilst you know, uh, stuff i'd done on the course uh, stuff that got published um pretty much immediately after the course and that's i haven't amazing. looked back since yeah wow wow that's really amazing to be published before we even finished the MA, that's so cool. I mean, oh, yes. having that drop, or that sort of weird thing where you finish the MA and suddenly you're like, okay, what happens now? You're yeah. already sort of running and, and going. It was fantastic. We did have that sort of lovely thing that publishers, because publishers, a lot of in British publishers know about the course. So they'll come to you. So you don't have to take your portfolio all around London or, or wherever. Um, pitching your stuff so there is that sort of element to it so there is a bit of sort of uh, luck involved but um but yeah you know, it's was, it was really good experience brilliant and when i first started when i first got the idea of doing picture books one of the big stumbling blocks was that i thought okay i can sort of draw yeah. if i've got something in front of me and so i thought okay well i like drawing animals and i like children's books oh maybe i can do a picture book and then it's just obvious now, but at the time it hadn't dawned on me that when I made up a story, I had a story about a little wolf that liked stories and listening to, to, to somebody read them and stuff. And I suddenly realized, well, I don't have reference photos for this. I, I don't, there's nothing I can copy. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, illustrating is a completely different skill from drawing from uh you know observation yeah. and these two skills seemed like for years just seem like completely separate things yeah. and i just had no idea how to bridge that gap and i was just wondering um if you had that and if there was anything that you could tell us about how you went about bridging it for yourself yeah, sure. I mean, yeah i was exactly the same i was when i first uh before i sort of i, I started learning about picture books really you know I, i'd make my own sort of children's drawings and i would only use 
other people's work as reference and i wasn't sort of using observation drawing or anything like that for reference and, and it just becomes generic because you're just copying someone else's work and then i discovered observational drawing and and i well, i love observational drawing I, I draw every opportunity i can but what i discovered was that the references that i could feed into my illustration work weren't like physical references it was more atmosphere color palettes gesture I did a lot of drawing in uh, British pubs when I first started observational drawing um, and I learned and through that I learned so much about tone because in lots of pubs the lights very low so you get very limited tone um, you have limited color palettes immediately so I learned loads about limited color palettes I learned loads about gesture and uh, observing the human form and now I use all that sort of reference material um that experience as it were and it feeds into my illustration so it might not be a copy of the man that i saw in the pub but his gesture uh, his presence the way he sits you can convert that into an animal you can, can just convert that into a character so it's not a direct reference but it's yeah. uh, it, it sort of moves on so yes observational drawing really informs a lot of my illustration but not directly Mm -hmm. But what I, what I found that was maybe it's because it's a mindset thing as well, because when I could draw from observation, I was incredibly detailed. And so I had okay. this, you know, very detailed, every little hair on the wolf's fur was sure. there. Blah, blah, blah. And then when I drew from imagination, it looked like a three year old had done it. And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like the gulf. <laughs> and yeah. so somehow I think now I think maybe I wonder if drawing in a sort of freer, allowing yourself yeah. to be more experimental with style and stuff um, in your observational drawing or in other types of drawing, yeah. then sort of makes yeah. you a bit less uh, found that middle ground or somehow. I'm not sure. I am sort of still searching for it, but I wonder if, I, if I, mindset I, and style has something to do with that as well. I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. I think um, when when I sort of talk about observational drawing, I'm not looking to capture every detail of the scene that I'm drawing. I'm, okay. I'm more trying to capture the essence of the place um, and the feeling of the place. Yeah. And you do that through experimenting with different materials, with different colour, spending different amounts of time on a drawing. So, you know, give yourself a minute to do one drawing give yourself an hour to do a drawing and you'll have two completely different drawings and you'll learn complete two different completely sets of skills uh, so yes I, i'm not looking to sort of uh, capture every detail from life i'm more experiencing and i mean observational drawing is i'd probably say 70 percent looking and 30 percent actual drawing so you're you know you're absorbing the scene you're properly looking you're seeing how, what the temperature is you're seeing you know you you look at a scene and you instantly get a color palette you'll just think oh well there's more blue and it, it just feels blue today and so that can affect your your drawing and then that can all feed into your illustration so you're using that same sort of level of experimentation in your illustration work as well how oh, interesting yeah i was thinking about your color palette because i was looking at your beautiful um have you seen Elephant? And that's such a, a charming book. And the color palette is really original. It's unusually, um, I don't know, uh, toned down. And I guess when you said about the pub and the, the lower light, and I was like, yeah, maybe that's where it came yeah. from. It's just- That's uh, exactly where it came from, Deletta. Yeah, right? it's, it's, it's all based on uh, either cafes or pubs, like low light sort of environments. Yeah. And so I've borrowed all of those color palettes and just used them in a, in a children's book yeah it's actually but Gita sent a question about that she said color palettes any tips on how to how to create them do you that that was kind of how that came about and that was kind of an yeah. organic thing is there something that you do when you're like okay this is a new a new project um how does that how do you go about <laughs> deciding what kind of colors you're right. going to be using yeah. yeah i mean um again it's sort of a, a feeling sort of thing but i i like many people i assume is I, is sometimes overwhelmed by color um and so like you know if you sometimes you have this sort of impression of children's books being these amazingly colorful things and every color is thrown at it yeah um but if but what i try to do i mean if you sort of flick through sort of my books they f appear colorful but if you take it spread by spread they're actually limited color palettes on each spread there's just lots of 
lots of individual limited color palettes so what i try and do is just start with sometimes i don't even know what that color is going to be but i'll just start with one color for one spread and then see if that feels right and if not i'll just change the color palette but i won't throw loads of color at it because i'll confuse myself and overwhelm myself so it's basically just doing what you can handle and if mm. you can handle two colors that's fine and just yeah and just try and find the color that, that feels right for that particular environment or that spread that's so interesting because so that's kind of comes through it's hard to and maybe because i'm not such an expert but it, it's hard to pinpoint what it is that you're doing to make the feeling come through but it does come through there's so much warmth and so much um of a, a feeling in your in your illustrations and in your books and somehow it gets translated into the colors the the gestures the style and everything but it it's, it's so amazing because it's a piece of paper and yeah. somehow that yeah. then but then the reader it gets retranslated into a feeling into the sure. reader it's sort of a magical yeah. thing it's really amazing it and like all magical things there's not like a formula or, or a specific way of doing it is you know a feeling sort of thing yeah. but, but what you can do is you can just basically you know you walk you know as we exist as we live mm. um we experience you know you'll see a color palette you'll go out and you'll see a shop and it'll have a certain color palette and you go i love that color palette just make a note of it you don't even have to you know copy the colors just make a note of those colors that you loved working together um you know you walk in a park and there's it's autumn and there's two predominant colors i love these colors just make a note of them because yeah. you know they work because you've seen them and experienced them so yeah, yeah. and they had an effect on you or somehow yeah. you've had, yeah. you've had a, a visceral uh, your response to it so yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing um, this is from Elena from uh, from Italy. How are ideas for your books born, and how do you develop them? Um, good, good question. Um, <laughs> I, I, do you know what? A lot of my ideas come from walking. When I go on really long walks, and when I just I'm not thinking about anything else apart. Well, I'm not really thinking about anything, and then things just sort of happen. Yeah. Um, all my books or all my ideas are based on something very very simple so I, I i never have like massive long narratives of lots and lots of complicated characters and things like that everything i do is based on one very simple idea mm -hmm. and i and i like to make the image you know make sort of images i don't even know what the story is i've just got an idea mm -hmm. so i just make lots of situational uh sort of uh images basically so uh, when i did fergus barnaby goes on holiday i just knew it was going to be uh, a story about someone who lives in a block of flats and it was going up and down the stairs so i just started drawing all the different people that might live in that block of flats i didn't know if they were going to appear in the story or not so it starts you start world building and then narrative sort of start appearing in all, in all the drawings that you start making i i'm a lot some people sort of like look to make lots of notes and sort of like uh have lists and lists of notes and that's absolutely fine that's an absolutely fine way of working but i have to sort of draw things and that's how i and they're not very good drawings they're very quick they're very scrappy um i will i'm more than happy to show my bad drawings to people um but but that's where ideas i generate ideas just by doing lots of sort of um situational drawings basically that, that's amazing yeah that was a question that grace had asked it's asked if the illustrations if this, the writing is driven by your illustrations or if the illustrations are secondary to the information of the story but it seems like the illustrations are really how the ideas get generated yeah, yeah. so the idea is there very small kernel of an idea and then yeah. i have to sort of find it through through lots of drawing yeah. um and, and that's sort of like different when you when you're illustrating someone else's text where right. they've got everything fully formed I find that really liberating as well because you know they've built this world and then we can envisage it completely differently and add our own sort of narrative sub narratives to it as well so that's really fun as well yeah I remember in one of your books I seem to remember you had some little mice that were that were an additional sort of yeah. narrative that was going along it wasn't in the text at all really that book was a very very simple uh narrative super simple like hardly any description at all and from that uh, we built a huge city world with lots and lots of 
uh, subplots and lots of things happening. You know, uh, it's basically a sense of community. Um, it was great fun, absolutely great fun. Yeah, I heard once somebody say that animating, and I was wondering if it was the same for illustrating, that animating is akin to acting. And um, then, so they were showing the animators who'd done this movie, um, you know, filming themselves, yeah. acting, acting out the scenes and everything. Do, yeah. do you ever do that? Does that, is it the same for illustration? I, I think so. I think um, if you want to know what someone's looks like when they're sort of angry or upset by something, I will sit here with a mirror and be angry and upset and draw <laughs> that. Um, and again, that goes back to observational drawing because you, 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 when you're observational drawing, you're not always looking for a specific thing to, to draw. Things just happen and you draw them. So yeah. there, there'll be you know examples in my sketchbook of people having an argument or people having a loving relationship sort of thing. And you can use that, is that you know, real life actors, as it were, uh, that experience yes. to, to sort of oh, reference. That's interesting. So more but getting things like act, you will yeah. do it as well if you if you don't have the yeah. The real exactly, life yeah. sort of reference. Yeah. Cool, cool. It's like muscle memory. You've just, you know, you've experienced it. And so if you're looking for a specific emotion to sort of convey, um, I'll go, oh, yeah, I remember I, I remember that couple and they were doing this. And, and wow. sort of go back to your sketchbook and you sort of go, yeah, that's how they their bodies moved and that's how they acted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Another question from Grace. You said, in your opinion, what elements make a picture book successful or indeed what would you say uh, can make them unsuccessful and what is success when it comes to children's literature that's a really good question <laughs> uh, if i knew that the secret of the perfect picture book i i wouldn't be telling anyone <laughs> I, <don't. laughs> um, um, I mean for me i i i love simple simple um one of my colleagues describes this really well simple but amazing so a really simple narrative or a simple concept told really well um, or told beautifully or mm. told really economically just something simple told really really well i think simple but amazing is just a really nice sort of way to uh, approach picture books when you become too when you overcomplicate things not only do you overcomplicate it for yourself, sometimes you can overcomplicate it for your audience as well. So if you've yeah. got a nice simple idea and you tell it well, you can do all those things that like we said before, where you've got this really lovely sub, uh, simple narrative, but you can add all these subplots in your images and have fun with it that way. But the, you know, the bones of the of the narrative, the bones of the picture book, super simple. Yeah, and trusting that that's going to. That, that that's not not there that you need to add stuff because i think with yeah. a simple idea you think oh well that's not enough i need to add all these other bits and then exactly. it's you're complicating and you're actually writing a novel i've done that i've tried to write a novel in 24 pages and it, it doesn't really work but I, I remember an experience with you when we when you had your yeah. one of your your narratives and every time I saw the letter, I'd kill off another one of her characters because it was just too many characters. And I think we ended up with two characters, didn't we, at the end? Of yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what every every tutor told me every time. It was like, I would kill off this one. I'd go home, kill it off, <laughs> change all the story, come back, and then another tutor would come up and say, I'd kill up the other one. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> exactly. Finally, yeah. I arrived at you. And I'm like, please help me. <laughs> I've killed off everybody. Yeah, no one's left. But, There's no one left. It was a really good lesson. So yeah, so it's keeping it simple and like, and like you, I think you're exactly right. Trusting yourself and going, not saying, well, it, it's too simple. It's, it's yeah. too, I need to put more in. It's more often than not, you don't. Yeah, and then the amazing bit comes afterwards, I guess, in how you yeah, the elaborated. Fun bit, fun bit. Yeah, 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 beautiful. Yeah. Ah, um, and we it, this came up when we when we first met because I had my little son on the course because my mum hadn't arrived and I ended up bringing a wolf on the, on yeah. the Cambridge course and so then we got chatting and you said yeah. that you were a dad too um how has that has that influenced at all had anything to do with becoming a, a picture book maker or does that inform how you I mean obviously your son's older than wolf so maybe he's not reading picture books as much now I don't know but does, has that had in his fatherhood had anything to do with your your um, creativity but, or when, when I first started, Teddy wasn't born, um, um, and then 
when I was first sort of making images, he was almost too small to be sort of a reference, as it were. Uh, but now he's older. It's it's quite strange, really. Even though he was uh, not around when I was first making the, the first few picture books, I can see him in those picture books. It's, oh it's quite God. weird. I mean, I don't know if it's because I was observational drawing anyway, but yeah, it's just maybe it's because my mind is very childlike and I just love the way children move around and, and just yeah. observing them and see how they interact with each other. But yeah, I mean, he's a terrible judge because he says every he loves everything that I do, which is oh, lovely. That's adorable. But but it's not, you know, he's not a great critic because he won't go. Actually, Dad, that's not, that's not right. That's not working. Oh, that's so <laughs> sweet. That's so adorable. But also, I was thinking, you know, when I read the books to Wolf, I'll, um, sometimes I'll, I'll get a sense. I haven't really analysed it, but I'll get a sense of the one picture book. Maybe, it's, for example, the illustrations are more helpful. They tell. There's more action. So yeah. actually, he's able to follow them better. Uh, whereas other picture books have lovely illustrations, maybe, but they don't actually tell the story much. Sure, and I've sure. noticed that the ones where the, the actions tell that help tell the story more are more successful with him, for example, or just yes, sort of yeah, yeah. testing even other people's um, books on. on yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's really interesting. I mean, every child is different, really. Yeah. But, but you do. Yeah. You want to connect with with your audience, basically. <laughs> And you want them to feel something from you know a child you want a child to sort of get something from your books um so i, mean, I think it goes back to the simplicity thing and just like you know if there's something simple for them to hang on to but also all this other interest that they can sort of that keeps them engaged yeah. um so yeah i mean i think one maybe big influence from having teddy is that i've read i think the same similar to you is i've read lots of books to him now yeah. and i know which I think exactly the same as you which one he engages with and which ones he doesn't yeah. um and that's really helpful for me it almost like a research on a research basis yeah 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 but that's probably the most useful thing i mean his critique is terrible but that's been really useful <laughs> I, that. I haven't tested mine on wolf i don't i haven't had the courage <laughs> Yes, I know. Yeah. It's hard. He loves me going into his sc schools, though. He loves me going into his school. Oh, wow. And, and he, he's, it, it makes him really proud, so that makes me proud. So, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that is just adorable. I love it. Oh, it's so sweet. Um, what about materials? I, I, I saw from the videos that you sent me that you mix both sort of, um, I don't know, what is it, analog? Well, what do you call it? Like real like inks, paint, yeah, all that yeah. stuff like that. Yeah and also digital like how yeah. does how do those things influence your process and how do you yeah. balance the use of those two aspects that i think many people seem to think of them as separate whereas you seem to use both in a in a really good way yeah i, I mean i i mean i the digital thing is is almost a control thing is that i it's that i love um sort of you know physical mark making i love making all these ink splats and you know drawing and with a pencil and using every you know basically every book i've done has been different material because it's whatever's nearest to me at that particular time <laughs> what you can reach on the yeah. table <laughs> yeah. um so uh, but then the the digital element is sort of a way of wrangling it all together controlling it um I've sort of I've tried to move away from colouring digitally as much because I I like to have an understanding of colour and why colour works and you know I've done it in, in my sketchbook so why can't I do it in my illustrations so I'm trying to move away from that a little bit but yeah it's just the digital element is is a control element it's just basically having all this fun with mark making and then sort of bringing it all together digitally it's all everything I do is handmade mark mark wise i've got this thing where um i mean i've got nothing against digital brushes i've got nothing against digital art i think some people do it absolutely beautifully but um i can't mimic my the way i make a mark on digitally so i have mm -hmm. to make that uh, it's probably you know a laboriously long process but i just need to have that control with my pencil and the control on the computer so it's that it's that finding that balance of you know 
how much mark making do I make? How much control do I have on the computer? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's some beautiful digital art out there. But yeah, I just I need that physical scratching on paper and throwing paint at the wall and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the fun bit. Yeah, exactly. Does does the digital side also help with the cohesion of the book in the sense of sort of a consistency or is, uh, within like from spread to spread or is that not necessarily part of it? Possibly. I mean, there is that sort of control element. But I, I once when I'm making books, I don't always have the time to experiment as much as I used to experiment with like, different media. So I love my always love my first three spreads or four spreads because that's the time I'm experimenting and finding finding new ways of working. I, I guess, like you say, when you get it onto the computer, that's the way of sort of bringing it back and controlling all these weird things that I've done analog. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's the element of control. So yes, yeah, so maybe that is that is bringing some consistency in. But after the first couple of spreads, I sort of know what materials I'm using for that particular book. So I, I've limited that at that stage as well. Okay, so you've you've um, narrowed it down and figured it out. Yeah, yeah. Just... yeah figured it out. That's that's good. Best yeah. way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so another question from from Amber Lee from Canada. She says, "How do you handle and work with that inner critical voice when doubt or rejection comes up? How do you work through it to keep going?" That's a brilliant question. Um, I mean, we all, you know, everyone suffers from imposter syndrome. Everyone sort of uh, has that nagging doubt about is this good enough and the other problem is for illustrators as you work by yourself quite a lot of, of the time so you're it's you just you looking at the work so even if you do think something's amazing no one else has ever seen it and so when they do see it they can go well this is wrong that's wrong you go, oh yeah I'm, I'm, I'm rubbish at this i'm hopeless at this so what i mean it's always good to have sort of a network of trusted people um, they don't have to be other illustrators. They could be anyone that, whose opinion you, you trust, um, who's honest with you, but not, you know, who's empathetic as well. Um, I've got um, uh, Begita, um, my my long friend who Deletta knows well, um, and Marta Ortez, and we 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 just send each other stuff, you know, mid process, and just ask honestly what they think about it. Um, so having the sort of you know you've got to be willing to show this work basically because at some point someone's got to see it but having people to help you on that journey is really really useful i also um have periods I and mean, the letters will know this i have periods where i avoid social media so i don't <laughs> <laughs> because i get overwhelmed by it because it's like yeah. so much beautiful stuff and like and, and the thing with social media is it, you know it, you get that impression that everyone's doing better than you but we're all suffering the same struggles and we're all going through the same thing so sometimes i just avoid it for a little while and just you know take a deep breath think about my stuff maybe go and do some observational drawing um um and do stuff that i enjoy doing rather than you know something i've got to do for somebody else um so yeah having that network of people that you trust not uh, comparing yourself to other people is really really important uh because you know you're you're you and you want to be authentically you influence is a wonderful thing because we can't help but be influenced but just don't be influenced by one or two people be influenced by everything by other illustrators by artists by architecture by uh build the yeah, buildings just going for walks You'd be influenced by everything and it just makes your voice more authentic I, I think i think when i first started i'd like i'd like have like two or three picture books that i loved and i was like well i want to do books like that and then you soon realize that well when if i do it it's just a lesser version of of, of what what i'm copying essentially and then when i was at university i was being you know having experience of all these different sort of ways of working all these different techniques all these different artists some of whom you know i'd never want to emulate in any way but i just loved certain aspects of their work and it all if you let it all feed into your into your um uh, your practice um it sort of makes your voice more authentic because you're you're using all this stuff but you're making it your own and the more you know it's fine to borrow 
compositions, color palettes, things like that, because you love them, but you've got to make it your own and make it authentic. And the more things that you look at, the more authentic your voice can be. Yeah, amazing. And what about teaching? Now that you are teaching um, as well as, as making picture books, how do those two things sit along each other? Do they influence each other? How, what do you like about them? Well, I, I, I it's like a two, twofold thing. I thought I get massively inspired by students and seeing their learning, mm. um, their learning journey. And then I get home from teaching. I'm exhausted. I'm so ex inspired, but I can't actually physically do anything because I'm so exhausted from teaching. Oh, no. <laughs> but, it, but it is wonderful to see, um, see, see people go through the this, this similar thing to what I went through and just have those, these revel revel I can never say, revelations, uh, moments where, you know, they go, oh, I, yeah, if I work this way, you know, this can happen. Oh, I understand sequence better if I just do this, this and this. And it's lovely seeing that. And it's lovely being part of that journey. And also it makes you, you know, it ups your game because, you know, you say, wow, these people are pretty good and they're coming up. I've got to you know, <laughs> one work. I've got, to, you know, I've got to up my game. But yeah, I find it really inspiring and very rewarding as well. Amazing. Um, but yeah, and, and exhausting, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, would, what advice would you give to somebody who's maybe fallen in love with picture books? but it's not sure whether to go like MA route or they're feeling a bit low. It can be quite lonely at the beginning. You're not really sure yeah. what a picture book is. You've read a lot, but you don't know what the rules are. You understand that there's some sort of format and you're sort of put, you don't know, nobody around you knows that you want to do this. So they're no. not really reflecting anything back to you yeah. that your new identity that you're trying to build that you're like, Oh, I want to be a writer. I want to be an illustrator. No. They're still treating you like, you know, you're not. And so it's hard to, yeah. to believe it yourself. Um, that's a kind of a hard moment. Nobody's waiting for your work. There's no agent sort of calling that's you it. saying, yeah, how's that book going? Yeah, yeah. Or no deadlines uh, or anything like that. Is there anything that, that you could advise people in that stage? I mean, I would start keeping a sketchbook of everything. Uh, maybe, you know, even if you're not com comfortable with observational drawing, maybe just trying a bit of observational drawing. Just keep a sketchbook of all your ideas, all your sort of things you're interested in anything really just sketchbooking um yeah i mean that's that's really important but also there are sort of um as organizations i think worldwide that sort of like where people who are like-minded can sort of get together there's this uh s i can never say scwbi in in uk i think that's in the states as well i'm sure there's a U in europe as well but these are like uh, people in that situation where like you say they're in an environment where there is no one else doing exactly the same thing as them so it's just a connection thing um it's a good place to find the, that network that i was talking about before where there's lots of like-minded people who are really supportive and everyone's going through the same sort of process ma's or uh, universities not for everyone because it's one is expensive um and two you know people have lives and uh it, yes you know, it's difficult to sort of you know put aside everything for that but if you're continually sort of sketchbooking and then making these contacts through these uh, organizations that do exist um and they do conferences and they have guest speakers and uh they have breakout sort of groups you know there'll be uh, an organization that will exist in leeds or in uh canada or wherever that will be semi-local to you so they can have meetups and things like that or you can just do everything online so it's finding that network is really really important and also these networks they have advice on how to approach publishers they have advice on how to uh, uh storyboard advice on, lo on lots of different aspects of picture book making or or any sort of uh, making um so they're really good sort of resources but the only sort of way you're going to sort of create work is by making doing stuff is actually doing it and that's where the sort of self-doubt thing comes in but you know if you keep if you you've gotten a good idea keep pushing it keep trying it keep making keep drawing um yeah just just keep 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 creating basically um and uh it, it, things will start to happen the more i mean i always say that drawing everyone can draw it's a it's a practice thing it's a doing thing um everyone's got a different way of looking at the world 
and you know it was a unique unique way of looking at the world um and so yeah just keep pushing that and just keep making basically find those networks keep making yeah absolutely i totally agree i think the networks thing they're both absolutely essential but i i, I wrote to even just reach out to somebody now with what i find amazing is that now we've got instagram we can write to people yeah um or even email you can you can google somebody that you read yeah. and people in this industry are so lovely i've found are, everybody right. I've, I've i've reached out to has been just so warm and lovely yeah. Uh, and my life changed at one point because I wrote to uh, Natalia and Lauren O'Hara. Um, they're, they're sisters and they make picture yep. books together. They're amazing. And I just wrote to them because they, their first picture book had come out and I'd seen it and I'd fallen in love with it. And that night I, I, I just thought, I'll write to them to congratulate them because the fact that they were sisters and they, it was their first book, I just yep. kind of I connected with them. They didn't feel like authors sort of on a pedestal. They felt like real people. And so I dared to... To look them up and i found their email address and i just wrote them a quick letter to say congratulations i have you know, best wishes for you next thing i know they haven't just thanked me they've invited me on a meetup and i'm wow. at a meetup in london with all writers and illustrators and i hadn't even started i was yeah. i just got in on the ma at roehampton so i i was just like a figment of my imagination oh. really more than oh. anything you know i've yeah. done a few drawings but not more than that and suddenly I've been welcomed in this. And so if you can use, I find that if you can use the internet, but then actually meet people in person. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise they're just names on, you know, and they just, yeah. you can't yeah. really connect emotionally or really properly with people. But if you can then actually get them in real life, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then it's just like magic. <laughs> it's so yeah. wonderful. I mean, this, the, you know, there's things like the Bologna Book Fair as well. Absolutely. Where and that's a, I mean, you know, people come from all over the world to look at picture books, but there's just communities of illustrators all at different levels of, of their career, all hanging out together. Yeah. And so it's, you know, they've got a shared interest of illustration or picture books or the world of children's literature. Yeah. So everyone's, you know, everyone's on this level playing field, basically, and everyone's, in, yeah. you know, it's what everyone loves. I did exactly the same as you. I contacted... Uh, do you know Jim Kay, who did A Monster Calls and did the Harry Potter books? Oh, my God, yes, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. He came into university and did a talk, and he let slip that he lived near me. And so I emailed him and said, oh, great talk. Um, you know, I live near you. And he was like, well, come over for dinner then. Oh, and my so, God, that's yeah. amazing. And he's the nicest guy in the world and taught me loads about sort of in the industry. Um, you know, I was a neighbor, you know, and I you know, you know a student starting off, starting yeah. off. And yeah. he was like, yeah, no, no, come on, I'll, I'll invite you, do you oh, meet this art director, do this, do this. Everyone's so lovely. Yeah. 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 Just have to reach and, out and, yeah. yeah, yeah. Amazing. Oh, that's beautiful. And if people don't reply to you, it's generally just because they're busy and yeah. it's not because they're being rude. It's just because oh, they haven't got time to answer. But if you've got time, I'll always, I'll always answer people if, I, if, if I'm not busy. Yeah, definitely. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And that's kind of why I started the retreats because then when I found that it was COVID and I'd finished the MA, suddenly there was no contact with anybody. I had to come back to Italy yeah. and suddenly I was alone in my studio and I'm like, no, no I want to find a way to, to be with these yeah. people that I yeah, love yeah. so much. And amazing. I want to help other people make those connections. So Brilliant. also that's why I didn't organize them online because I didn't want to do it online. Everybody's like, that's how it's going to work financially and everything. Like, no, I want to get people to know each other and spend a wonderful week together and Amazing. really make those yeah. bonds that are going yeah. to them. And maybe they'll be in all different countries around the world and they can keep in contact via, you know, Zoom yeah. or whatever it is. But, they but they're connect. really yeah, genuinely yeah. connected and made friends and they can have yeah. that support group. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the picture books are hard. They're, they're not an easy, they're not an easy process. They're a hard thing. So having this support from everyone and having this sort of community has been wonderful. Where everyone's looking out for each other. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, uh, last two, we need to send a few funny sort of short questions. What's your <laughs> dream project? Do you know what my dream project is? I'd love to illustrate Dracula. I don't Amazing. know why. I really would love to do a really an, a gothic piece of uh of fiction i'd just love to do it 
I could Amazing. make sort of departure from what I don't want to do, but I just. But I have really... seen uh, when you when you were maybe uh, on your MA, you did a uh, a book that had that sort of gothic feel. Yeah, I've seen some of those illustrations. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So something along those lines. Yeah, I just love to Brilliant. do something a bit darker and a bit more, yeah, a bit... Uh, yeah, 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 edgy. Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. And uh, top of materials to bring to Rome to sketch, since you're coming. Um, and we're going to do lots of sketching and picture book making. Carry, really. Um, <laughs> yes. It's, I mean, yeah, I mean, just stuff that you can sort of make interesting marks with, really. Just like, I mean, some people just love using a, a, a sort of like a... I don't know a four B pencil and just you know push that to the limit. But the more fun, it's more fun to try lots, lots of different things. I think my basic kit is um, ink, black, just black ink, um, uh, a brush, a couple of brushes, a bigger brush and a smaller brush, a dip pen, uh, a probably a very soft pencil. Um, what am I just looking at my desk? See what I've got. Um, <laughs> I quite like these charcoal pencils. They're quite good fun because they're very unforgiving. So they don't let you noodle. They don't let you do loads of detail. Um, and a, a really, really small box of watercolours that's really dirty. All my materials are cheap. Um, all my materials are ruined because I don't look after anything particularly well. But I quite like that sort of scratchy, dirty sort of element. Even my scanner, I haven't washed for about six years, so it's got marks all over it. Wow. Okay, my dear. Well, thank you so, so, so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. It's been good fun. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, see you in March. Brilliant. Look forward to it. Look forward to meeting everyone. Yeah, we do. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Brilliant. Take care. See you later, then. <laughs> Bye. Bye.